hey, everybody. Um, great to see you. A- anybody else? You know, when we say we're doing 24 hours of prayer, anybody else think, oh, is the expectation that, like, one person is going to be praying for the whole 24 hours? Is that just me? I definitely have to resort to tongues, I'll tell you that much. Um, Hello, it's really lovely. Thanks, Ben. Um, really lovely to uh, to be together. And yes, just to add to what the guys are saying earlier, um, so good to have you here. Um, if you're on your way in here, you're really, really welcome. Um, and just before we start in the, the Word of God today, I, I just want to flag something that um, I, I suppose has come up quite quite a bit recently in um, conversations with individuals, something that we've been chatting about as a, a staff and, and leadership team uh, as well, and it's, it's to do with relational dynamics at the moment. And uh, we know that God has asked us as a church to be a thriving community, and, and there are always areas where we could um, do that better, aren't there? Um, but I think just realizing that in the aftermath of Two lockdowns, two years of um, I, I, two years where develop relationships and their development have, have, I suppose, been severely limited, haven't they? Lots of people are um, just finding that their uh, their friendships and their interactions are. I suppose just in a bit of a strange place. You know, maybe you recognize that in, in your own life where maybe people and situations have um, moved on a little bit. Um, it's left some people feeling quite lonely, actually. And uh, we can all have a tendency to think that um, everybody else is better relationally connected or, or cooler than we are, can't we? But um, I, actually, um, isolation's been a, um, a, a common feeling for some as people in that place. And um, social anxiety, likewise, you know, whether it's large gatherings like this or um, just the unfamiliarity of new people or, or new homes being in, um, or even just this strange COVID dynamic where every interaction is accompanied with this, um, am I okay, you okay, in terms of sort of where we meet inside, outside, masks, when testing happens, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's just a, a, another barrier to connection, isn't it? And of course, some of this predates COVID anyway. So I just want to say, if, if that is you, it really is okay. It really, really is. And please do own how you're feeling and know that Jesus will help you through. And encouragement would, would simply be to talk to someone, not to suffer alone, but talk to your home group leader, talk to a member of the staff team. Might be they feel someone else can serve you better and they'll point to them, but just not, not to suffer alone. It's not wrong to say that um, you're struggling. It's not wrong to say that there's uh, things that you think we could do better um, as, as a church family together. Um, And just to know that being family means that we will stick together, we'll stand with you, we'll walk through things together, we'll work out these issues that arise uh, because we love one another and because we have been loved uh, just as we have been loved and and brought into the family in the first place. Um, I I suppose for all of us, the encouragement would be, as I I know very much is uh, is all of our hearts, just to have lots of patience with one another in in kind of the recovery from these times and recognizing that people might be in different places uh, to where they were, uh, whether that is uh, emotionally or in terms of time and availability or in terms of how they're feeling about the pandemic, but just for all of us to, as Galatians 6 encourages us, to carry one another's burdens, to go above and beyond in uh, being inclusive in the social events that we organize and in who's around our dinner tables and in who we talk to on a Sunday, things like that, to be the change that we would love to see in the family of Grace Church. So I just wanted to begin with that, just to kind of normalize uh, the feeling, really, just to open this discussion up. It's it's no surprise that the pandemic hasn't just affected us individually, but in the ways that we um, all relate together. Um, but Jesus is faithful, and he will bring us through. So I think it'd just be good to pray for us um, as a community together, and then we'll get into um, reading the word of God. So Lord Jesus, we recognize that this is your church, your body, your bride. You're the one who unites us together. And so I just pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be um, a community that has so much patience with one another, a community that continues, seeks to um, include and and reach out, um, a a community where um, your grace is so demonstrated amongst us. And Lord, just in this time, we just ask for your blessing upon this in this particular area, particularly for uh, those feeling a bit lonely or isolated at the moment. Lord, you're the one who puts the lonely in families and you've uh, you've brought us together as a family. Lord, so just help us to uh, thrive more in you as you work your purpose is in us, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I hope that was helpful. Feel free to ask questions afterwards. 
But um, uh, we are in the midst of a series in Matthew. If you're new to the Bible, Matthew is an eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And um, Jesus is preaching a, a sermon that gets called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he's almost at the end of it. And um, the bit that uh, he is preaching about today is, is entitled in my Bible. The titles are inserted, but build your house on the rock. Anyway, here's what he says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. It's hard to think of many passages in the Bible, particularly if you've been around church for a while, that have informed better known children's worship songs. Yes, I'm sure lots of us will know the wise man built his house upon the rock song. I won't sing it for you, but Hannah and Gus, do you guys know that one? Bit of a response at the end, do we think? Yeah, she's laughing in my face. Um, but actually, unlike most kids' Bibles, um, this isn't just a story um, in isolation. In fact, no part of the Bible is. It is part of one big story. And so you've got wise man, house, rock, foolish man, house, sand. It's not particularly complicated. There's a kind of PS, storms will come to everybody. But we have to ask what Jesus is meaning here in, in telling this because the consequences actually seem quite severe in the way that he describes it. In the, the, one of the um, books of Bible stories that my kids have, um, this story is in it. And what happens in that one is that the foolish man ends up in the house of the wise man because his has fallen down. His washing ends up kind of drying on the nice, kind wise man's line outside. And they're hanging out together. It's basically universalism, you know, salvation for everybody. But it's not actually what Jesus is teaching here. Actually, ultimately, the reference is, is to the kind of end time storm of judgment that, that comes to all. And so we have to ask, like, what is Jesus meaning here in conveying this for our good and to reveal more of himself? And I suppose the place you start is the context, of course. Every time reading the Bible, start with the context. And it's in this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is casting a vision, a vision of life with him as king. And I'll save you the full explanation of the whole thing. But essentially, coming towards the, the end of this sermon, he is basically saying, look, guys, you can take the law. You can take the rules. You can take your own ability to fulfill them and live out the ethics that you uh, think you can live by. You can look to yourself or you can look to me and the new way of my kingdom and the grace that already qualifies you before the Father. He's saying you can have DIY spirituality or you can have Jesus-centered life. And don't we find that is just a daily choice in a society that says we stand or we fall on our performance? And some of you guys at uni just finishing latest round of exams and they're kind of, how did those go? Maybe it's the job center asking how many jobs you have applied for in order to get the latest round of benefits. Maybe it's hitting the criteria for the next stage of career progression or your company's quarterly figures. Maybe it's trying to kind of achieve a certain social media image or physical appearance. All around us, our world says that rewards come from achievements. But the grace of God in the gospel says that you are already qualified. You are already accepted. You are already delighted in. It promises the faithfulness of a Jesus who will never cancel on you, who will never call you not good enough, who will never reject you. Frankly, the choices are extreme. It center our lives on us or it center our lives on Jesus. In um, 2019, so immediately gives a uh, before COVID reference in all of our minds, doesn't it? It's our very own BC, before COVID. Um, <laughs> been working on this one this week. AD, after distancing. Yes, heard it here first. Before COVID, I had my first ever experience of an escape room. Now, who here has been to an escape room? Yeah, hands up. General nods, did we like them? 
Yeah, yeah, around the room. If you're not kind of familiar with the concept, essentially there's a room or number of rooms, we'll call it number of rooms for, for this analogy, where um, there's 50,000 of them around the room. Not, not rooms, that would be a lot of rooms to get through. 50,000 escape rooms in, in the world, series of rooms, they're all locked. And the idea is that you have to solve a series of challenges or puzzles to get you into the next room and go through the rooms to kind of complete the story um, as it were. One leads to another. And doing an escape room for the first ever time, I learned a number of things, a number of very key things. The first one is this, you definitely need to go to the toilet before you enter one, you know? <laughs> Learn that the hard way, if you're yet to do one, take that on board. Number two, it is definitely not a first date destination. I should qualify, I was not on a first date. I was just reflecting, be like, if someone ever suggested that they were about to take someone on a first date, in a room where you're literally locked in together, and the whole aim is to try and get out of there, uh -uh, definitely not the dark ones. I also learned that Chris Marsh, who is on our sound today, is incredible at escape rooms. If you want to win, take this guy, Chris, over here with your escape room, and you are guaranteed to win. But this story that Jesus tells today reminds me a little bit of an escape room. Because let's say that this first revelation of grace, DIY spirituality, or Jesus-centered life, let's say that's the first room that we find ourselves in, the kind of surface-level interpretation, if you like. We've worked out that Jesus is the rock, that we build on him, that everything else is dumb. That's kind of where, where we are. But there's much more going on behind it. There's more rooms, more places to discover, to see the wider story, because in a beautiful and profound way, God has, has sown a journey into the scriptures to show us more of Jesus. So let's go to the second room. If the first room was um, the, the room of grace, the second room might be called the room of wisdom. The room of wisdom. And that is to say that when the original hearers first heard Jesus tell this story, there would have been a mix of people, but the majority of them would have been Jewish. And when they heard Jesus talk about terms like wise man and foolish man, it would have opened up all sorts of cultural and scriptural references in their minds in the same way that words like social distancing or cancelled or me too would do for us in our world, just in perhaps a more positive way than some of those. They're not just descriptive words, there's actions and there's memories behind them. So when the hearers heard Jesus say these words, they would have known that wisdom in the scriptures involves a life that is totally submitted to God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Psalms and the Proverbs tell us. Moses says to the people of God in Deuteronomy chapter four, he, he tells them to submit to God and to his law, for that will be your wisdom, he says to them. Solomon, the king of Israel, at his coronation, turns to God and asks for wisdom. Even Paul describes Christ himself as power and wisdom from God. He's saying it's not about what you know. It's not about your skills. It's not about your intellect. It's about submission to the one who defines your life. The question is, is that you or is that him? And wisdom, the Bible says, is the latter. And it would be the same to do with foolishness as well. Foolishness in the scriptures would be um, prioritizing yourself over God. It would be exchanging the uncreated for the created. Have a look how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 1. He's talking about people living away from God. And he says this, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And we have our own cultural equivalents, don't we? My rights, my fulfillment, my comfort, my destiny, my potential, my journey. And yet when the focus is ourselves, don't we just find that that is completely sinking sand. If, if we put our hope in being healthy, let's say, kind of widely um, and, and good you know, value, but if our ultimate hope is in being healthy, well, we will know that the last two years have really undermined that. The same to do with wealth and financial prosperity. That's our aim. That's what we build our life on. If we put it on being true to who or what we've decided to be, we have to look around at our society and see a looming mental health crisis. 
to know that we really cannot manage and fulfill the weight of our own expectations. I was fascinated to find a Times article in my research for this that talked about MI5 who operate on a principle that society is only four lost meals away from complete anarchy. And you can kind of see that at the start of the pandemic, can't you? Do you remember the rush for loo roll? Yeah, I won't ask to, won't have hands as to who the hoarders were, you know. Or like the petrol crisis, or crisis from like three months ago, where there's no crisis, but everyone just kind of raced to the stations. It's around Rosie's wedding weekend, wasn't it? Or even like in the UK, it's when it snows. You know, like we're just rubbish with snow, aren't we? Like one little bit of snow, like everything comes to a standstill. You'd have to conclude that wisdom is the Jesus-centered life and the life of self-actualization, self-focus, really is just foolishness. It's just sinking sand. But there's more. If that's the second room, that's the room of wisdom, let me take you on to the third room. And the third room defines what Jesus means by the rock. You've got the wise man, the house, the rock. We haven't done house yet, so sorry that's not in order. Some of you will be fuming. But either way, let's turn to Matthew chapter 16 to see what Jesus is meaning by rock. Reading from verse 15, and he's, here's what he says. So Jesus says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, rock and Peter sound very similar in the Greek. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is building his church. And he's talking about people. So he's building us. Jesus is building us, our family, together in him, uniting us and changing us. That means he knows and he cares about every detail of our life together. And how about you? I find that a tremendous comfort when we think about relational dynamics or any other kind of storm or challenge that we might face. He has got us. He really, really has so you say, well, what, what's he building on them? What's this rock? Like, is that Peter? Uh, the Catholics would say so, yeah, with all the kind of whole Pope thing. Even some Protestants would say, yeah, of course it's Peter. Like, he's a key leader in the early church. And then Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit falls and it's Peter who gets up and says, look guys, here's what's happening. This is the new age of the spirit. I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what's going on here is a moment of revelation. Peter says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. The gospel of Matthew is all about the revelation of Jesus as the king of the kingdom, as the long promised Messiah. Even right back in the very first verse, he says, look guys, this is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Here's his genealogy. Son of David, son of Abraham. Oh, and he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. God the King come to be with us and make himself known. Jesus is building his church, his house on himself. On his self-revelation. On the grace that has been won for us. On his atoning death that pays for our every sin. And on his life-giving resurrection. You think, well, how are we ever going to raise money for an offering? We're going to talk more about that next week. How are we going to thrive more as a community? How are we going to reach a city with the gospel? Because Jesus has made and continues to make himself known. So you take all of that and you go back to Matthew chapter seven, that first room of grace, the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And you have to say, well, then who is the wise man who submits himself to God completely? Who is it that builds his house upon the rock? It's not ultimately us just making good decisions and doing good stuff. It's Jesus. He builds his house, his church, and he builds it upon himself. 
And true wisdom, the scriptures say, as we saw in that second room, is to get on that agenda rather than our own. The good news of the gospel is that he has already delivered us from our sand building folly and he set our feet upon the rock. Folks, this is who we are now. His agenda, not our own. Him first, not us. And it's a daily decision to live in it. And of course, lots might say, yeah, yeah, of course, JP. But I genuinely think that this is more of a challenge than we realize right now. I was talking to um, one of our home group leaders recently. I thank God so much for our home group leaders. These guys who serve Jesus so faithfully, often with very busy lives, just giving um, of whatever free time they have or don't have to love people well, to organize week on week to have people in their homes around a dinner table, just to love as Jesus has loved. And just, wow, I thank you so much, Jesus, for our home group leaders. And um, this particular home group leader, she just put language to, uh, I suppose, a kind of feeling I'd had where she talked about the way that the last couple of years have, have caused lots of introspection. And I thought, oh yeah, she's, she's really right there. It's, it's limited the, the correction to our self-obsession that, that comes when we see and we relate to others. It's, it's caused all of us lots of personal challenges, but without necessarily seeing those that are suffered by others at close quarters. And it's made our primary question, how am I doing, hasn't it? And if you're anything like me, if we're not careful, if we don't leave that unchecked, we can actually start thinking that church is actually about our fulfillment or our needs being met. But doesn't Jesus bid us to come and die to ourself and our needs? Doesn't he encourage us to take up our cross daily? Doesn't he say that when the focus is on saving our life, we will lose it, but when we put the focus on him and loving God and loving others, not ourselves, that we will gain it. And actually, we find that as we give to others in the very moment of our challenges and our struggles, what we find is that he also meets our needs by his grace anyway. That's the rock of revelation. He will build his church and he won't forget his people. Guys, I know and I recognize, because I see it in myself as well, that there perhaps could be something scary about getting out of the thought patterns of the last couple of years. We think if, if I stop asking this, like, how am I doing? Are my needs being met question? Then that will leave me feeling a bit vulnerable. Like, won't, won't I be forgotten in all of that? I don't feel like I have the energy to pour out into others. Here's the revelation. Jesus is building his church, and he will not forget his people. I want to go one last room just before we finish. So we've had the room of grace, the room of wisdom, the room of the rock, but what's Jesus building? He's building his house. And um, I don't know about you, but when I recognize that church is entirely made up of uh, works in progress, also known as people, all of us in that category, that um, church gets plenty wrong, doesn't it? That I think nationally as well, like the way the church uh, is, is known by some for judgmentalism or um, like horrific things like child abuse scandals or or sometimes just a bit irrelevant in the way that it's talking, there can be a, a tendency to separate our love for Jesus, who is matchless and without fault, from how we see church. As though it's some kind of slightly bad but necessary byproduct to the Christian faith and nothing kind of better has, has been invented yet. And yet, when I see myself and I, I see like the centrality that Jesus has given to his church. And I see Paul described as the very body of Christ. I think, hang on a minute, something has gone wrong in my thinking here. So the final destination, the final room I want us to go into is 1 Peter chapter 2 and the glorious picture that Jesus gives of what is happening. And I'll keep going because it takes a bit of a while to get to 1 Peter. There we go. I can beat me to it on the words anyway. Reading from verse four, this is what Peter, same guy who, who made that revelation, that the father revealed to him, you're the Christ. Peter writes, as you, that's us, come to him, that's Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God's chosen and precious. It's a description of Jesus. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, and he's referencing Isaiah here, behold, I'm laying in Zion, the city of God, the plan of God, that refers to a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Again, that's describing Jesus. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Peter says, as we come to Jesus, that's verse four, he builds us into a spiritual house for himself, that's verse five, on himself as the rock, that's verse six. Which leads me to conclude that following Jesus and giving yourself to your church family are inextricably linked. To love Jesus is to love his church. I know a, a couple in Grace Church who um, their jobs mean that they're very, very busy. They don't have an awful lot of spare time, but um, they've, uh, I suppose, before God just um, concluded that one of the things that they do have is uh, more resource than some. And so, whereas as leaders, we don't know what uh, people give in the life of the church. I just incidentally happened to know these guys made a decision to, to give really, really well and uh, give out of their, their resource. That's the way they see building the church. I was speaking to another person who, um, again, she's in the midst of a very busy season of life, but um, her conviction was what I want to do to love my church family is to have someone round for dinner on a regular basis who's either new to the church or um, just seems a bit uh, on the periphery just to kind of love them well. I think of another couple in the church who uh, maybe would have identified with, with some of the things I was saying at the start, actually, of kind of a bit sort of, where are my friendships and, uh, and what, what's kind of happening at the moment? And, and yet feeling this, like, I love this church family. And so their conviction was to, to give of themselves and invite some people around to try and uh, get to know them. And, and what's happened in the course of that is they felt much more kind of joined up and connected and, and the joy of, of, of following Jesus. I was hearing... Uh, this week of um, the hours and hours and hours that some of our kids leaders put into uh, planning sessions and sorting rotors and making sure people are okay, making sure our teaching is not just good moral advice, but Jesus-centered, grace-filled teaching. I was talking to another person in our uh, young adult community who was saying, I'm not just after a group of friends that is just the same people every time that just gets really tight and no one else comes into it. I want a family where it's all sorts of people, where everybody is welcome, where sometimes it is a little bit socially awkward, but we're family together following Jesus. I was talking to another guy, again, young adult in our community, went for a drink with him. The chief concern on his heart is how can we best welcome and integrate people into to the life of church. He didn't work for church or anything like this, he's, and he's a busy guy, and this is the chief concern of his life. I think of some of the people who first accessed Grace Church through our 12 o'clock service and seeing them around the building and fixing all manner of things across the building and uh, painting rooms and tidying things up and just serving and loving with what they have. I see the meal rotors that we do for new parents, and I see that they're full of people who are very, very busy and yet want to give of themselves. I know my own home group leaders decided to be the answer to their own prayers for more home groups. All of these busy people just doing what they can, following Jesus in humility, as Paul says in chapter, Philippians chapter two, counting others more significant than themselves. And of course, so much more that I never get to see, but Jesus does and he builds his church and he doesn't forget his people. Church will look different for different people according to time, calling, health, stage of life, finance, and the talents that you've been given. But to use Peter's language, everyone's a brick in the house. Everyone is a brick in the house. Everyone can change someone's life. Everyone can assume well of one another or, or decide to give rather than seek to get. Everyone can talk to someone they don't know or text the person who seems a bit on the periphery. Everyone's got a part to play. I wonder today for all of us, what is our part? What does laying aside our own needs for the sake of others look like for us today? If you don't know this incredible Jesus, I want to encourage you to get on his agenda. 
because in giving up your life, you will find it in the most wonderful way. But for the Christian, well, the Christian is never really locked in the escape room anyway, which means we're never truly stuck because the wise man who submitted fully to God is building his house, his church, on the rock of his salvation plan. And no storm is ever going to take that down. Shall we stand together? It would seem um, to be an appropriate response this morning. We've still got a good bit of time. Um, just to pray together as, as a church family, as a community. And um, we've heard of the glorious vision that Jesus conveys us to his church, his body, his bride. And the part that we have to play in it, recognizing that, as John referenced earlier, he's the king who reaches right down into the midst of our difficulties and never forgets his people. And what I'd love us to do might be that the band gives a bit of background noise. I'll, I'll leave them uh, leave that up to them. But I'd love us to pray for our church family. And you can pray for whatever you like, really. It might be to do with the parts that we all play. It might be how we can better thrive as a community. It might be lamenting what's been difficult you know, as we've journeyed together as the past couple of years. It might be just praying in that beautiful picture that Jesus gives of this house that we're being built up into, where everyone is a brick in the house. In the last couple of years, it's made contributions in worship a bit harder, hasn't it? You know, and we've had to get used to mics and all this kind of stuff. We've got some learning, some relearning to do in these things. So what I'd love in, in the next kind of ooh, 10 minutes or so, if we want to, we'll see as the Spirit leads. I'd love for different ones just around the room to pray out short prayers, just asking Jesus to continue to build his church. I want to encourage you to be brave in this. It always takes a step of bravery just to step out into that. But to raise your voice, to just shout out where you are and just to ask Jesus to build his church. Let's have one after another. Do that. Just pray out where you are as well, just a helpful clarification. You can use the mics if you want to, but no need, you can pray out where you are. 